Today, we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures. It's Bible study, isn't it? Yeah. And I hope you brought your Bible. This is a tough lesson because of what it tells us about where we come and where we are and where we're going. And uh, if we choose not to heed the warnings in God's Word. So I've chosen to title this, The Hell-Bent Way of Cain. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray, I pray today that you'd bless your Word this morning. Help me to convey what you've given me. And most important, Lord God, that the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified. In his blessed name I pray. Amen. The Bible describes Satan in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen as an angel of light. We know this. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. The Lord Jesus said himself that uh, he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. He's a liar and the father of it. Turn with me over to Jude 10. And keep your finger there and turn over to 1 John 3, 11. Jude 10 and 11 and 1 John 3, 11. Jude 10 reads, But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally is brute beast and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. In 1 John 3 we read, For this is the message, 1 John 3.11, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. The first false religion on the planet was the product of the carnal mind. That God says clearly in Romans 8, 7, is enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It was founded by Cain, the first apostate. He was inspired, he was encouraged, and energized by the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 makes it clear that the God of this world, we know who it is, Satan, hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, Cain, first apostate, first murderer, the first person to become a fugitive and a vagabond drifter on this earth. And his religion was founded on rebellion. It pushed violence and focused on the wisdom and the works of man. That's just a quick summary. So we need to take a look at his life and the characteristics that the scriptures lay out that make for us and make up the way of Cain. Why? Because it's got all the marks and the foundations of what's going on today right now in this country and around the whole world. Without a doubt, these are dark days, folks. You know it. With the Lord's discernment, we can see evil abounding all around us. And those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ certainly know that our hope isn't in this world. It's not in our governments, militaries. It's not in our finances. Everything is changing before our eyes. The world is willing, willingly, though, running as fast as it can toward a deep fall and a terrible deception. And listen... Christian Bible believers aren't exempt from the effects of these poor choices by others. And sometimes we make those bad choices ourselves, don't we? I mean, mostly because of the lack of Bible knowledge and understanding. More than ever, though, we've got to be in God's Word, believing it, trusting the truth of God and what He's shown to us and told us. Yes, things are 
converging now. We see it. We've been talking about it. I mean, I've heard it said that there's a likelihood of more, more pandemics. And then there's the United Nations COP27 climate change conference that concluded this past November the 20th. Many of you know about that. In Egypt, where Emmanuel Macron and others, leaders, were leading the charge to bring in this new world order. I mean, Chrislam has positioned itself to be the driving re religious force of our day. And religious leaders from all the world's religions have been coming together under the banner of the Vatican. It's everywhere you look. Abraham Accords were created and brought to life in the Pope's declaration of human fraternity to the Muslim people back in 2019. Now, the United Nations COP27 climate conference is meeting and met in Sinai, Egypt. Chris Lam took center stage. As interfaith leaders, they all gathered together and unveiled their climate change, get this, 10 universal commandments there on what they say is Mount Sinai, calling on the world to repent of their climate sins to Mother Earth. I kid you not. It's insanity. If you're familiar, not familiar with the Abraham Accords, or UN COP27 and their new god of this world called Mother Earth, look it up, look on the internet. It's all over, you can find it in their own words. And then there's the global elite, top World Economic Forum advisor, Klaus Schwab. You've heard of him, Yuval Noah Harari, who declared in a recent interview that the vast majority of the world's seven and a half billion people are simply no longer needed. Simply no longer needed due to technological advances in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and bioengineering. That's what he said. He said, of all things about our coming enslavement to technology, and he's 100% in favor of it. Not only that, he's a major supporter of eugenics, New World Order. And top it off, which isn't surprising to me, he said openly that he hates the Lord God of the Bible. <clears throat> Harari said that we don't need some God in the clouds hanging down tab handing down tablets because we've created our own cloud and our own tablets. That's what he said. It reminds me of Revelation. He opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and the tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. I'm not saying he's the Antichrist, but I'm saying that spirit is among us. This is where we are. Even as the president here in our own country is ready to sign a law, he are, probably already signed it. I don't know. Sadly, Congress now passed the mis, misnamed Respect for Marriage Act, which is said to provide protection for same-sex marriage and repeals, gets rid of, in other words, the Defense of Marriage Act passed in 1996 that recognized marriage as a legal union between one man and one woman, husband and wife. Amen. Folks, listen, this is what we've come to in our country, which in essence is going to make your King James Bible a banned book with Christians in prison for preaching the gospel of the grace of God. In other words, it's going to remove religious protections in America. It'll call the Bible that you're holding in your hand right there as hate literature. You watch. Your freedom of speech is next, just like right now. You don't have the right to say anything that goes against their narrative. And what they say or believe, because according to them, what you had to say about it is considered hate speech. Yes, it is. That's what they're saying. It's misinformation. This is what we've come to as millions around the world seem to be following in tune with these Pied Pipers over the cliff. But there's one thing I know for certain. It's the truth and comfort find, found right here in this King James Bible. And it's a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God. And he said himself, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Does that sound exclusionary? <laughs> it is. But the Lord Jesus Christ had his arms wide open when he died on that cross of Calvary. Taking your sin, my sin, and the sins of the whole world upon himself. Giving his life a ransom for many. To give everlasting life to anyone 
who would but believe and receive him as their Savior. But the world doesn't want that. They don't want it. They don't want anything to do with it. And this is where we're headed. And Cain didn't want anything to do with it either. So let's understand that's what's going on. Take hold of the truth and the warnings of God's word. Jude paints a vivid picture of the wicked. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Strictly speaking, there are only two religions in this world. One is the true religion called biblical Christianity, which is of God appointing and then there's all the other religions which are false and the product of man's mind that opposes the truth of God. Biblical Christianity is a religion of faith. All the others are just superstition, whatever form it comes in. Turn with me to Genesis 4. Genesis 4, where we read about the account of the birth and the life of Cain, the first son to be physically born on earth. And the first son who refused to be born again. In Genesis 4, 1, we read, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now folks, true salvation revolves around three essential things. The Word of God, the work of Christ, and the witness of the Spirit. And Cain's religion found a substitute for all three. All three. Instead of listening and wrapping his life around the Word of God and what he had been taught, Cain's religion focused on himself and what he could do. The Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Cain's religion ignored all that. It wasn't based on divine revelation from Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Nope. It was based on human reasoning. The basic philosophy behind Cain's religion was that salvation had to be earned and it had to be merited. Purchased at the cost of one's own effort and toil. And so Cain brought to God the fruit of all that which he had labored and toiled. Cain substituted trying for trusting. The salvation of God is based on the simple act of faith. That's why we read in Hebrews 11, 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead yet speaketh. Romans 10, 17 tells us, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. For Abel to offer an acceptable sacrifice, it had to be done according to revelation. In other words, God revealed to Adam and Eve the proper sacrifice, and they passed it on to their sons. Abel chose to obey God. Cain didn't. Cain decided he had a better way, so he thought. Now listen. The idea that good works earn salvation is at the heart of every false religion and cult on the face of the earth. You can read all you want of all the sacred writings of the East, all the isms. There's a ton of isms, 500. I mean, there's a jillion isms. There's a hundred of them. Whether it's from Buddhism who follows the eight fundamentals of right conduct. To Brahmanism, Hinduism, who wash in the Ganges. You've got your Muslims who count on fast in their pilgrimages. You've got Romanism based absolutely on a system of works. It's all the same. Liberal Protestants, the same. Same theme. Salvation has to be earned. To do all, all the cults do it. Same thing, same, same line, salvation by works. It's a human scheme, effort devised and planned by the devil himself. Amen. They all say salvation must be purchased. Yeah, it must be bought with a price, and that price is you've got to work for it. And that one price and purchase has got to be your own works by your own hands and what you do to deserve it. Cain's religion was concocted out of his own mind. 
idea based on purely human scheme as he listened to the whispers of the devil himself into his ears. And it ran counter to the heart and mind of God Almighty. It was impressive. Hey, man, it was beautiful, fantastic, but it was based, when you look at it, it was based all on error, the willful disobedience of God's truth. It's bluntly called the way of Cain in Jude, and it's marked down as apostasy. Look at verse 3 and 4. We see what he did. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Now look here. Here we find Cain's religion, instead of centering around the work of Christ, blood sacrifice, it has focus on purely on human sweat of his own brow. Cain's offering was without a doubt, it's costly. It personally, I'm sure it may have been costly, more, maybe more than Abel's. I mean, it was the result of toil and effort, work, persistence, careful thought. Cain substituted beauty for blood. That's what's going on. Throughout the Bible, the message is clear. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Ye were redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's how you were redeemed. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus in Hebrews. It doesn't make any difference whether it appeals to our senses, feelings, or our reasoning. That's beside the point. Those who criticize and condemn God's demand that he be approached only by blood are just not understanding. They're not comprehending the exceeding sinfulness of our sin. Paul laid it out in Romans 7, 13 when he said, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. You hear that? Not only that, but there's the failure to comprehend the awesome holiness of God. Isaiah wrote down the absolute holiness of God as he was shown it and described it in Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. Let me read that. It's good. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and twain he did fly. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved as the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then I said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So Cain, he substituted beauty for blood. His altar was an object of great beauty. I mean, my God, he was loaded with ferns and, and flowers piled high with colorful fruits. Vegetables fragrant with spices and herbs had all the colors of the rainbow in it. Oh, it was so attractive and he displayed it and he was so proud. To Cain, an altar was like a thing of beauty. Attractive to the eye and joy to behold. He fully convinced himself that he had won the approval of God. I can imagine, I'm sure, as he looked over at Abel's altar, <clears throat> disgust. I mean, it was a slaughterhouse. Blood was everywhere. A lamb had been slain and skinned, inward parts exposed. It had been divided into parts. The altar was red with blood, blackened with fire. The smell of burning was in the air. The coals, they still glowed. The smoke was still curling up into the sky. And Cain looked again and he saw Abel stoop down and gather up the ashes on his altar and lift up a tear-stained face to heaven and say, oh God, oh God, what a price to be paid for my sin. Cain was disgusted by Abel's altar. 
just like the apostates today say how shocked and offended they are by Calvary and its message of salvation by the blood of Christ. God's plan of redemption is based on the shedding of blood. Man's religion is based on beauty. Man decorates his faith with magnificent cathedrals. True. Soaring arches, stained glass windows. He's done everything he can think of to make his religion appeal to all the senses. So we'll be sure to be comfortable and feeling good. I mean, there's gorgeous rituals. There's litanies of all sorts and choirs. Let's not forget all the polished preachers. They speak great swelling words and lay out a bunch of pious platitudes. So you're feeling good. Psychological steps and formulas for improving your human nature and living your best life now. <laughs> Beauty is substituted for blood. In the end, there's nothing in it. It's empty. Oh, it might cause the flesh to go pitter-pat a little bit for a second and be pleasing to the natural man. But in the end, it doesn't do a thing to touch the soul of a man with conviction about his sin and his desperate need for a Savior. And instead, it just confirms him in his sins. As he goes out the door to live his best life now, with no change in his heart, without giving a thought of where he'll spend eternity. I looked up the words to a song so long, long ago. It's not cathedrals, it's not steeples, it's not crosses made of gold. It's not just sentimental stories that have been passed down from old. It's not religion or tradition that can save the souls of men. It took the sinless blood of one holy lamb. It's all about the blood. It's all about Calvary. It's about my mercy, about mercy flowing down an old rugged tree. It's all about grace. It's all about a sacrifice. God's love is all about the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the scarlet thread that ties the beginning to the end. It's a river of forgiveness to wash away our sin. It's a healing stream, a fountain, an eternal cleansing flood. And the heartbeat of the gospel will forever be the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's all about grace. It's all about a sacrifice. God's love is all about the blood of Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 7 is clear. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. And God said in Exodus 12, What I see, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And Peter tells us that we're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. But with Cain, there wasn't a single drop of blood anywhere. No blood shed anywhere. Cain brought an offering, but not a sacrifice. He expressed pious thoughts, but he ignored Calvary. He was willing to worship, but only on his own terms. Cain brought an offering to God according to the promptings of his own heart. But I ask you, who of us knows our own heart? Huh? The heart is deceitful. Above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? And this is the heart of every natural man. Cain's plan and approach made good sense to him. So Cain substituted feeling for, for the truth, for faith. He did. He just felt justified in what he did. His altar was beautiful. He was fulfilled. He'd worked hard. Here were the first fruits of his labor. He felt that God should, should certainly accept him. What more could he do than than what he had done. He felt good. Listen close. Listen close. The fact is, he was a sinner with murder in his heart because man-made religion at best only deals with what we do and has no power to deal with what we are. God's remedy gets to the root of it. Oh yeah, it gets to the root of the matter. We do what we do because we are what we are. We're not sinners because of sin. We sin because we are sinners. Amen. Are you following me? Even when Cain was building and decking out his beautiful altar, whistling and singing 
about all his self-satisfaction. He was a rebel. He was a sinner. Trying to approach God the way that knowingly put God's own word and his own will aside. That's the deadly thing about false religion. It acts like a, it acts like a spiritual drug, a narcotic. Based on on everything that makes people feel good about themselves. But God said in Romans 3, there's none righteous. No, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Amen. As a sinner gets pumped up with his religious works, Good feelings about themselves. You can be certain. You can be certain that the conscience is going to go numb. And pretty soon, in a matter of time, it'll be dead. In other words, the religious person having performed and done all the things he thinks ought to be so I can fulfill all the demands of uh, my particular dogmas and dictums and whatnot and church requirements. Now I feel I'm on speaking terms with God. Hmm. Oh, it's a lie based on feelings. Lie based on performance. Don't kid yourself, it's very subtle. And it seeps into the crooks and crannies of the soul. And you don't even know it. The Bible records there wasn't any recognition of sin and its punishment by Cain. There was no comprehension of the enormity of his guilt. No grasp of the need for blood. Atoning death of Christ, no grasp, no sense that his offering was an offense to God. The fruit of the ground he'd cursed. It was the work of his hands, the best he could do, but it was totally inadequate. It was an offense to God's holiness and the rejection of his son. There are millions of people today, folks, who are hurrying down Cain's path to destruction promoting his religion, his errors, and their pious thoughts of good works and religious rituals, social actions and all of that, mean nothing. They have no value at all in themselves apart from the finished work of Christ. The system Cain laid out ignored the witness of the Spirit and the Word of God. Instead, it focused on human satisfaction and pride, pride, where he could stand back and survey his altar and say, look what I've done. Justifying himself for all his efforts, he became his offering and everything that he gave. There, that ought to please him. That, ought to, that cost me a great deal. It's a beautiful thing I've done. I gave it my best. God could, couldn't expect more than that. It was purely humanly, purely his own satisfaction. He didn't have the witness from God that Abel had that he was accepted. The scripture tells us there, the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, and unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. Well, Cain's feeling of satisfaction and well-being didn't last too long. Because in a split second, that quick, it turned to resentment and rage. Rage. The scripture says in verse 5, And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt not, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Do you see this? Cain was invited by God to come the right way. Abel's way to bring the only kind of sin offering God can accept. The sacrifice, the blood lamb sacrifice, that's Christ. Listen, the difference between Cain and Abel, between the believer and the religious person, is not the person himself, but in the object of his trust. The way of Cain provides for himself. The way of God accepts what God has provided. God will accept us only in Christ. Like so many religious today, people, Cain, the founder of the world's false religion, burned with anger. Burned with anger. At what he had heard, he was wroth, the scripture says. He was angry with God for rejecting his offering. He was jealous 
of his brother Abel. In verse 8, says this, And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Now here we see it, right here. Cain's religion was marked and characterized by bloodthirsty intolerance, force and violence. Here he was, bawling with rage. And he looked for his brother out on, in the field. I wonder what they talked about. I don't know. Did maybe Cain offer, Abel maybe, did Abel offer Cain a lamb? Or the use of his altar? I don't know. The Bible doesn't record that. Maybe he did. The Bible just says that Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Cain tried coming to God in his own way. He brought all that fruit of the ground, work of his hands. Listen, the works of our hands, just to backtrack here, no matter what work it is, no matter how noble it seems, will never and can never be accepted by God. You see, God doesn't accept our self-righteousness. God doesn't accept our own efforts. God doesn't accept whatever sin-cursed offering we bring to Him. We've got nothing to bring to God. This is why it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ who came to save sinners. We couldn't save ourselves. We're cursed. We're sinners. We're doomed without Christ. And God only accepts us on the basis of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Represented by Abel's sacrifice, which God had respect unto. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I've said it, and we've said it from this pulpit time and time again. No man cometh to the Father, Jesus said, but by me. But the world wants to do their thing their own way. I hate Frank Sinatra's song, I did it my way. Ah, my gosh. They don't want to go by the way of the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ. The message of the cross offends them. The shed blood of Christ on that cross is offensive to this world. Just as Cain's pride resisted God's still small voice, the world is too proud to receive the Savior. And so then maybe wild with anger by Abel's quiet testimony, Cain, whose religion was too refined to even slay a lamb, plunged his knife into his brother's heart. And with that, he nailed down one of the greatest marks of all false religion. It's characterized by force, by persecution, by the martyrdom of those who stand for God's truth and the word of God. And before an hour old, Cain's religion produced the world's first martyr. Every drop of blood shed on the earth ever since in the name of religion helps mark the violent way of Cain. It was also marked by falsehood. Look at verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Oh my. Cain thought nobody could see what he had done. He thought he could hide what he had done from God. The way of Cain is the way of hypocrisy, falsehood, lies, and defiance of God. And when God asked, where is thy brother? Cain responded with a brazen lie right in the face of God. I know not. Hmm. That's what he thought of the holiest righteousness and omniscient God. That's what he thought of him. Mocking defiance. That's how it is with all false religion. It propagates in God's name a gigantic lie. For at the heart of all false religion is deception and fraud. And in God's name it struts big with defiance, attitude in the air as they're doing today. I'll brave it out before Almighty God who sees everything. I don't care. Such is the way of Cain. And it was marked by futility. For God simply stripped away all those lies, making a show of Cain and his religion for what they were. Look in verse 10. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And thou art thou cursed from the earth which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from my hand. 
When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. True faith made Abraham a pilgrim and stranger on the earth. False religion made Cain a fugitive and a vagabond. He was lost, cursed man who couldn't find any rest, peace on this earth. His life would be in wilderness, meaningless, washed, wasted, never satisfied. He'd spend his days wandering from God. That's the fruit of religion. That's the way of Cain. He was marked by fear. Look at verse 13. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out of this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Listen, there was no repentance in Cain's religion, no remorse, just resentment. He, he lived his life looking over his shoulder all the time, thinking he'd be killed by somebody. He didn't care a bit that God's hand was against him. His religion had brought him only greater guilt, ups, unrest and unhappiness and pursuing fear. God won't allow the sinner to have any peace in his heart and soul while he's entangled in sin and error. And so the scripture tells us that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. He was a fugitive and a vag vagabond and wandered the earth, founder of the world's false religion. Before he was finished, though, and sank into a nameless grave, a time we're not told, he made his way in the world, established a godless society that was bent his way. And that spirit of Cain has gone on through all the descendants after him right up to the day. Continuing to leave God out. Proverbs 14, 12. Look squarely at this hell-bent highway of Cain's religion. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That scripture ought to be written on the entrance to every temple, every shrine of all the false religions in the world. It ought to be placed over the door of every false cult meeting place. Over the door of every liberal church that doesn't preach the truth found in God's word. Amen. We're told to watch out for it. In Jude 4, what did Jude say? For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old obtained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You can follow it from generation to generation, folks. To this very day, it was materialistic and humanistic. Cain couldn't have his, if he couldn't have his own religion, he'd have none at all. He'd become the captain of his own soul, master of his own destiny. It was prolific. I mean, it population exploded. Men began to multiply, it says in Genesis chapter 6. Brought huge market for goods, services, especially as everything became more sophisticated. So people left the countryside for the city. God people put people in a garden. Cain put people in the city. Hmm. The city became an artificial garden, catering to every need, lust, want, and desire. You can have it all. It was hedonistic and pragmatic. In other words, it's pleasure-driven society. The entertainment was the order of the day, introduced by Jubal who invented the kind of music that gave people a beat and catered to their flesh. Tubal Cain brought in the world through industrial revolution and gave a growing industry based on science, engineering, and technology, and that became their god. It was absolutely ag agnostic and demonic, saying you can't know God because there is no God. That's what they say. In other words, it was godless. The Canaanites ignored the testimony of Enoch and the preaching of Noah. And their minds were blinded by the God of this world. And ignoring God, they sunk deep, deep into the devil himself. And they produced new age movement, deadly occult practices and everything else. It was pornographic. Anarchy was everywhere. The Holy Spirit tells us in Genesis 6, 5, every imagination and thoughts of people in the hearts was evil continually. There was the breakdown of God's established law of marriage. Replace that attitude. If it feels good, do it. Women were elevated. Shiva could 
not. In the Canaanite society, polygamy and child abuse was accepted as a lifestyle. There wasn't any restraint on crime. The earth was filled with violence, the scripture says. Everybody did his own thing with the nod and approval of society. Go right on. And the idea that God might have had something to say about it, about all that was going on, was ignored. The Canaanite society thought the building of Noah's Ark was ridiculous and laughable. <laughs> they figured that what was going to happen was going to happen. There's nothing anybody could do about it. Say la vie. Continue on. The Ark idea was a typical crackpot of the Sethites. Oh boy, such was the way of Cain. Such is the way of Cain today. In the end, God destroyed that wicked society and people and flood came and took them all away as God said it would. Yep. Yeah, it runs by the way of murder of Abel to the flood, by the way of the flood to Babel, by the way of Babel to the murder of Christ, by way of that crime of crimes to the lake of fire. Any person traveling the way of Cain doesn't express his spirituality, he expresses godlessness. It's a sin against the first commandments, an attempt to dethrone the true God and throne Lucifer. We know the name Lucifer over in Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which just weaken the nations? We know the name Lucifer means morning star or light bearer, the sense of brightness. Well, he's the false light, folks that this world is latched onto, and he described, as I've already described in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world that blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan invented religion, and in his religion, sinful man screams out rebellion, screams out opposition. I don't need God. I don't want God. As we come to a close, we're not done yet, we're almost. We need to realize that that's what's happening in our faces today all around. Without a doubt, the whole world is going the way of Cain, and this evil way is covering the earth as I speak right now. Let me ask you, do you find yourself going the way of Cain? I pray nobody in here is. Have you been defying God and refusing to see yourself as, as you truly are? A sinner in need of a savior? Are you thinking, well, I can, do, I, I can do better. I can just turn over a new leaf. I, 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 you know, I can try harder to be a better person. No, 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 no. That's all a waste of time. Performance will wear you out. And it'll never be a way to approach God. Jesus said, ye must be born again. Time is short. Now is the day of salvation. There aren't many ways to God. Only one way. We've said it over and over again. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I urge you, call out to Jesus right now. Ask him to save you before it's too late. He will. And you can get off that broad road, that highway to hell. And he'll give you everlasting life with him forever. And to all of us, all of us who are believers in our Lord Jesus, it's important that we always remember, listen, that God knows who are His. He knows you. He knows you by name. He, and you'll know it too by the Holy Spirit within you. God promised that when you trusted Christ alone by faith, that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Yes. We believe what the Word of God tells us in Ephesians. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. There it is. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Does that settle it for you? <laughs> it does for me. Hallelujah. Let this world and hell throw it may. <laughs> Let the devil send a flood out of his mouth. Let society get as confused as it wants to get. But this I know. Those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ are sealed in the almighty hand of God. Nothing, I mean nothing. No flood, no fire, no army, no demonic power, no poverty, no trial can take them out of his hand. Nothing. It reminds me of that wonderful verse. Mark it down in Romans 8, 
34, who is he that condemneth? Is it Christ that died? Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what do we do till he comes? We stand fast, folks. Strong in the Lord. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, not part of it, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Folks, I encourage you to keep spending quality time in the Word of God during this day we're in. Meditating on the promises of God and ask the Holy Spirit to make it so real in your soul that you can say with the Apostle Paul, I know whom I have believed it, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Hallelujah. Father, Father, I thank you. I thank you for every person here today. I pray you'd help us to wake up, to be ready, Lord Jesus, to stand strong in Christ. Stand strong in Christ in this evil day. As we look, we look for your glorious appearing any day now. I pray your word has gone forth and you'll accomplish that which you please. And in the coming service, Lord God, in a few minutes, that Christ be uplifted. Yes, that he be uplifted, that he be glorified in all the singing, all the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.